Okay, so today is sort of the last um, content uh, lecture. Uh, so it's the last kind of new stuff that we'll we'll talk about. Uh, then next week, and I think I'll go over this again. Um, the anything spillover from today we don't quite cover. I'll, I'll cover at the top of Tuesday, but then the rest of Tuesday will be a little bit of a sort of an, a an overview lecture, kind of a course wrap up lecture. No major new content will be introduced. Just sort of a, kind of an overall perspective. So it's not a critical lecture during Thanksgiving week. Um, and then, as you know, there's no formal labs at this point. Um, you know, all your lab time is sort of devoted towards your final project. So there's the Thanksgiving weekend next week. And then we come back for the last week of classes. So Tuesday, we'll have a final exam review lecture. And then Wednesday is when your final project deliverables, the presentation and report will be due. And then Thursday will be stage one of the final exam. And then Saturday will be when uh, your peer reviews are due. And then stage two will be during final exam week. So that's kind of a schedule uh, moving forward. So let's see what I've forgotten about here. So uh, ICAL is uh, uh, available. So that's due before Tuesday. Um, there's no more homeworks. Of course, lab schedule, um, pretty much just final project stuff. Uh, final project. Wednesday, last week of class, that night, a uh, 10 minute video for your presentation and a four page final report. There's a very specific format that's posted online. Um, then your peer reviews will be due Saturday of that week, just like I was saying. The um, final exam review activities, if you, uh, there is a final exam module that in order to unlock, you'll have to take the uh, lockdown browser compliance test thing, just like in the midterm, and that's in the module kind of right uh, in front of it. And once you take that sort of a one point thing to confirm that your lockdown browser still works technically, then uh, you'll get access to all of these resources. So there's sample exams, uh, so maybe some extra problems. There's uh, some kind of uh, ICA practice uh, things. So there's a lot, you know, it's very similar for the midterm. Um, all available for the final. And we know the final exam is a two-stage exam. So uh, in the last lecture period, uh, so the Thursday of the last week of classes, we'll have that. Um, oh, and I meant to look this up. I remember last time, I apologize for not correcting that, but um, I need to check the syllabus, but I'm pretty sure I specified uh, two sheets, but um, I'll look that up and then uh, update this. Uh, but it's whatever the syllabus says for sure. Um, but uh, so that last lecture period, uh, will be stage one. That will be the individual. You don't have to come to the lecture. You can take it at home exactly like the midterm. I'll extend the availability. Um, I think I've already made a decision on this. I forgot what my division, decision was. So if you check the availability window on Canvas right now, um, it's either going to be available all of Wednesday and all of Thursday, all of Thursday, all of Friday, or possibly Wednesday through Friday. Um, I just need to double check, but you're going to have at least 48 hours to start this 90 minute exam. So it's designed for 75 minutes, but as the midterm, I give you 90 just for any technical issues. And then during finals week, that's the collaborative stage two version, uh, exactly organized like the midterm. And I think that's about it. So any questions about the schedule moving forward? And it uh, looks like the audio is working fine. Great. Okay. All right. So uh, this is the last unit of this class, Variance Reduction Techniques. And so the basic motivation for this unit is that we want to achieve statistical power. And by achieving statistical power in terms of confidence intervals means we want to achieve narrow confidence intervals on our performance estimations. And we either do that by increasing the number of replications, um, but that is a problem because every replication might take a long time to simulate. So ideally, we would like to reduce the number of replications needed for the same power. So how do we get the same power um, for the same type one error uh, without increasing the number of replications? Well, the idea is, can we design an experiment to account for alternative sources of variance. And if we can do that, if we can subtract out variance that has nothing to do with the experimental thing that we're testing, then that will reduce the standard deviation in this formula, narrowing our confidence intervals and giving us higher power, allowing us more 
sensitivity, more discrimination ability. And so that's we're trying to use the same number of replications, but get more out of them. Or another way around using less replications for the same sort of uh, bounds on half width. That's kind of what we're shooting for here. And I mentioned that we're going to we're going over four of those in these units, uh, CRNs, control variates, anesthetic variates, and important sampling. Uh, we kind of we're supposed to cover these last two last time. We covered sort of all the CRNs. I'm going to review that now. I'm going to introduce control variates, and then we're going to either finish these today uh, or we're going to finish them on Tuesday. Um, so for the final exam, um, I'm um, expecting you to definitely be familiar with the differences between all of these. And in some of them, like antithetic variates and common random numbers, um, in those cases, as we'll see, there's some, um, it's, and I think you can see examples of this on the test exams, it will be relatively easy for you to do numerical examples of these on your final exam that um, help you demonstrate that you understand the difference between AVs and CRNs. And so um, we can, uh, we can either, we can talk about that actually kind of once we get to them or next week or during the review lecture. So definitely know the kind of high level differences between these four basics VRTs. Um, and then also for um, definitely CRNs and AVs, um, you actually be able to kind of, if I give you a random number feed, know sort of how to use it in a way that's consistent with a CRN or an AV. So we'll see what we mean by that as we move on. All right. So uh, CRNs, we covered this last time, and we've seen these kind of, you know, in a number of different contexts already. The basic idea that I'm going to run two simulation models or multiple simulation models, all with the same random number speed at the beginning of every replication. So for as many uh, simulation models as I have, one, two, three, whatever, I'm going to run them all for the same number of replications. And then every replication is going to need a random number seed in order to generate, uh, you know, customers or whatever the, the source of variance is. Whatever the input model is, generating variance, is going to need a random number seed. And so I'm going to say across the board, every replication one, regardless of what model I'm using, uses this random number seed. And every replication two uses this random number seed and so on. And that helps me ensure that I give the same challenges, the same inputs to all of my model. And so the, hopefully the variance that's left over is variance that only has to do with differences in models and not differences in the random inputs given to those models. Mathematically speaking, we can say that we know the variance in the difference between two uh, performance measures is equal to the variance in one performance measure scaled down by the number of reps plus the variance in the other performance measure scaled down by the number of reps minus basically the correlation between the two. And so if your two models behave in the same type of qualitative way, so a difficult stream of customers for model one, is also difficult for model two, then that means the performance is gonna be um, relatively worse in both models to some baseline number of customers. So as long as a hard condition for one a model is also hard for the others, then that allows us to subtract off the kind of intrinsic difficulty from the inputs that you've chosen. And that's what reduces the variance so that the variance um, in with this design will be less than the variance you get if you did independent uh, replications. So we're introducing dependence to reduce variance. And so because of that, we have to use a paired difference t-test to compare the system. So we have to take it to subtract the differences from replication to replication. And this is exactly what you did in the muffin simulation. Uh, you gave uh, the same customers or the same muffin schedule to both a, a greedy oven um, policy and a nearly full oven policy. And so every schedule, that's every line is here's a different schedule. So these are one set of muffins. This line is another set of muffins. So that allows us to say for this set of muffins, which one's better? For this other set of muffins, which one's better? For this other set of muffins, which one's better? And by making these apples to apples comparisons or muffins to muffins comparisons, then we can see that although if I get rid of the pairing, it's fuzzy because it looks like, well, sometimes greedy's better 
um, you know, says so like this nearly fool is worse than this greedy. Or if I'm looking at time and system, it's the other way around. This nearly fool is better than this greedy. But when I pair them like that, then I see, oh, actually, for every single muffin batch that I put in there, muffin schedule I put in there, um, then a nearly full takes longer than greedy. So that suggests to me that, aha, greedy is actually a little bit better. So if I stop focusing on two populations and think about it as a population of differences, so this is what I'm plotting here. This is like muffin schedule zero. This is another set of muffins. So it's like these are 10 different sets of muffin orders that are coming into the oven, then I can see for every muffin, uh, for every string of muffin orders coming in, you can think of this as this is Monday, Tuesday, whatever. If you run Monday um, uh, on one policy or the other, then I can see the red dot, which are the nearly full policy are always higher than the open circle dots. And although we can see that the midpoint of these lines bounces around a lot, if we, kind of forget about how the midpoint moves and just look at the length of these lines, then the length of these lines is always sort of in one direction. Like the blue dot is always less or always lower than the red dot. And so if we plot these differences, then um, then that ends up allowing us to sort of think of this as um, you know testing to see if these differences cross zero. And these differences, if my differences are always say blue minus red, then I can see that the confidence interval on those differences um, is unlikely to include zero. And so I can generate a confidence interval across these differences and it won't include zero. Or put it another way, I can do a pair difference t-test across these pairings and um, I'm gonna get a P less than uh, 0.05, which indicates that there is consistently speaking for uh, a wide range of inputs, it's always the case that red is uh, worse than blue. There is a significant difference between them. So that's uh, CRNs for my example from the muffin sim. Uh, for the books example, they do something similar uh, where they talk about what if you had uh, just an MM1Q versus an MM2Q. So just a Q, one server versus two servers, we expect the two servers to be faster, but how much faster is it going to be? Well, this is without um, any uh, pairing. So it's sort of arbitrarily paired. So we put one set of inputs into the MM1 queue, another set of inputs into the MM2 queue and looked at their differences. Of course, there's no reason to pair those two because the inputs weren't together. And I can see that like, sometimes I get huge differences, but I don't know if those huge differences are due to the differences in the queues or was this input just much harder to deal with than this input. And so if I do a you know an apples to apples comparison and put the same inputs into all both models and I do that across a hundred different inputs or hundred different replications. Then now I see there's very little difference between the two models. So each one of these differences is small, but I do notice that generally speaking, the black dots are on top of the open circles, and the open circles are the two server model. So that means that the wait time is slightly less than the two server model. So this increase in power gives me more sensitivity. I'm able to actually see that there is a small difference. You know, if I go here, uh, you know, th sometimes the difference is positive, sometimes the difference is negative. Um, and my confidence interval, if I were to do a two sample confidence interval on these independent replications, it would probably include zero. P would be greater than 0.05. And I might say, well, that must mean that there's no difference between one server and two servers, but that's not the right conclusion. What this uh, more higher powered example with this paired design tells me is there is a difference between one servers and two servers. It's just a small difference. So this design allows me to detect small differences and that's the value of getting the extra power of doing the blocking. So that's what CRNs give us is they reduce the variance so that we can find small differences. All right, so any um, questions about the general idea of CRN? This is something that we've seen a couple of times. It's very similar to your homework G3 part one. Okay, so we can implement this in Arena. Uh, basically, you can pull in a seeds element and you can create random number streams that have this initialized option set to common. And what that does is it ensures that when you go into your repl replication setup and set it to do you know, more than one replication, that 
it will start with a uh, standard, whatever your seed value is here. So if you leave it blank, it's the default value. And then every replication after that will be 100,000 plus whatever the, the seed value was for replication one. And that allows you to ensure the same random number seed to every replication across models. And that's all I'm summarizing here. So um, thing to remember here is if you wanted to create your own streams, so you wanted like maybe one stream at common random numbers, but yet another stream that was sort of another source of randomness, like, you know, it's part of your policy, like your policy might be that you want to do something random in one policy and deterministic in another. Well, those you might not want to pollute the random number stream by using the same stream. So you can sort of say that, okay, for this process, I want to use one random number stream. For all the other processes, I want to use another random number stream. So any expression that draws a random number in arena, the final argument um, is you can leave it out, but you can also put in, it's an optional argument, the name of a stream that you've you put in that seeds module. So that allows you to say some streams have are common random numbers, other streams are the normal way. So that's how we do it in Arena. And if you were to do this in real life, um, common random numbers assumes that um, hard inputs for one model are also hard for another model, but sometimes that's not the case. So generally, before you go off and do hundreds of common random number replications, maybe do 10 or less than 10 as a pilot study and get the variance of one model, the variance of another model, and the variance of their difference. And if the variance of their difference is, um, of their paired difference is less than the sum of the two variances, then that indicates that uh, common random numbers will probably be a good VRT for you to use. All right, so any questions about CRNs? Back up, see if there's questions online. Okay, all right, so one we, um, we're gonna talk about last time we didn't get a chance to is control variant, CVs. So um, this is a motivating example. Um, imagine uh, natural variations in power output at a power plant. So you've got, uh, you know, a solar power plant, and you're measuring the power output coming out of that. Um, some of the, if you made an operational change from one power plant to another, you might want to see uh, how much did my change affect the power output. But um, some days you're going to have different sort of uh, levels of light coming in from the sun than others. You know, some days will be cloudier than others. So um, the so the question is. Can you, that's going to be another source of variance, basically. So you could say, I'm going to run my power plant this week with one policy, and then I'm going to run the power plant next week with another policy. And we assume that as long as I don't like, you know, go like uh, across a holiday or something, that every week is pretty much similar to each other. But still, the weather might be different from one week to another. And so that weather difference um, might explain some of the differences between those two weeks, or generally it's going to generate more variance. And so the question is, if I know the weather in both weeks, can I subtract off the variance caused by the weather? So the only other variance left over is the variance caused by my difference in policy between one and the other. And so um, I can say that more abstractly to say, um, if I have X and Y are correlated, the information about the difference between X and its mean should inform me whether Y is uh, far from its mean. So if I know that I'm on an abnormally hot day, then I'm gonna expect the power output might be hotter or might be more than usual. If I'm on a, an abnormally cloudy day, then I might expect the power outage or the power output will be cloudier than usual. So there's gonna be variation in one variable that I can manage to subtract from the other variable. That's what we're going to try to do here. So I've got this uh, just stated out here, written out for to read later. But if output is correlated, output Y is correlated with temperature X, subtract each day's output Y by a special amount proportional to that day's difference from its average temperature. And that will help us control the variation on the output. What does that look like? So mathematically speaking, I've got um, my output Y. That's the thing I'm trying to estimate the mean of. 
What is the mean output for this performance strategy? And by itself, it might have a lot of variance. But I've also measured temperature or some other variable X that I think correlates with Y. It actually doesn't have to correlate. It just works only if it, if it doesn't correlate, this will just drop off. It'll degenerate into the Z equals Y case. So if I know that this variable X, and I also know this variable X is mean, so I know the mean temperature, so I know the temperature today and the average temperature, um, then what I'm saying is if I can see how far away today's temperature is from average, I can then come up with some scaled value of that to subtract from today's performance output. And if I build, so and then I want to estimate the, the mean of Z instead of the mean of Y. Now, if I look at the, you know, what is the mean of Z? Well, the mean of Z, just using probability theory, is equal to the mean of Y minus this thing, which these things cancel out. So the mean of Z is equal to the mean of Y. So if I can estimate the mean of Z, it'll be an unbiased estimator of Y. It's totally safe to estimate Z to give me an estimate of Y's mean. But the hope is that I can actually get Z's variance less than Y's variance. So I call Z my control variant. I call it a control variant because I'm, it's, it's like a version of Y where I'm controlling for or accounting for the variance due to X. And I can then do a little calculus. So I can say, well, what is the variance of my control variant? Well, probability theory, the variance of Z is going to be the variance of Y minus this expression here. Well, then I can say, well, then how do I choose C to minimize the variance in Z? Well, I can just uh, take um, you know, this expression, take its partial derivative with respect to C, set that equal to zero and solve. And what I find is that the optimal value of this constant C is the covariance between X and Y divided by the variance in X. So if there's no correlation, no covariance between X and Y, if X has nothing to do with Y, C just becomes zero. And this Z basically is equal to Y. So I haven't done any harm. But if X and Y are correlated, if there is covariance between them, then this value C ends up actually subtracting off things in the right direction um, from y so that I actually can make the variance in y smaller. So uh, I can estimate this covariance x and y and variance in x from data. So I don't even have to design my experiment for this. As long as I have the temperature data and I have the performance data, I can do this afterwards. I didn't have to build a new experiment for this. And it should reduce the variance in z so that my, my confidence interval on, on z is smaller. Well, let's see that, I think, in an example here. So, um, yeah, this is just me saying the variance in Z is equal to variance in Y minus this term here. So the greater the correlation, the less the variance in Z. Okay, so what does that look like? So here's a really simple example. Um, so imagine I just drew uh, X from a uniform distribution between zero and one. So I know the mean of X is 0.5 because that's the mean of a uniform distribution. So you can pretend like X is temperature data. And then I've got Y, um, I'm going to say is the exponential function of each value of X. So um, pretend like X is a simulation. So it's like, it's like X, you know, is an input model and the exponential is the simulation that is taking the inputs and generating variation. So the variation that I get um, on Y is due to the variation I get on X. And then I can see how far each X is from its mean. And so I'm gonna use that to hopefully improve my estimate of what Y's mean is. So I can do this particular problem because the exponential function isn't a simulation. So I, in this case, can generate ground truth. I know that the mean of, um, of the exponential over the distribution specified by X is 1.7183. So if I generate a thousand numbers uh, or a million numbers from the uniform, pass them all through the exponential and take the mean of the result, I should get something close to uh, 1.7183. So I do that. So I'm gonna generate a thousand replications of X from uniform distribution between zero and one. This is just in MATLAB. And I'm gonna then generate Y, which is gonna just transform each one of those by the exponential. 
And I can take the mean of y and I'll generate its standard error of the mean. And I get a mean of 1.7085 and a standard error of 0 0.0157. And so that's pretty close to what I'm expecting. But I want to say, can I reduce the variance in, um, in y, or what I'm going to say in z, um, without having to generate any more replications? In other words, because I know information about x, can I make this interval tighter? And so how do I do that? Well, I'm going to just say, um, I'm going to estimate the variance in x, so variance in x, and I'm going to estimate the covariance between x and y. And so um, in, at least in MATLAB, if I do covariance X and Y, it generates a matrix and I can extract the covariance term that I need uh, with this little expression here. Um, don't really need to get into that, but this is the variance and that's the covariance. So I can create this constant, which is just covariance divided by variance is that thing. And then I can build a random variable Z, which is just all of my Y values minus 1.686, times each x value minus 0.5, the mean of x. And then I can estimate the mean um, and standard error of uh, this random variable z. And so that's what I'm doing here, mean of the z, standard error of the mean of z. And what do I find? Now I'm 1.72, which is closer, and my standard error is 0 0.002, an order of magnitude better in standard error. So I've actually greatly reduced the variance without adding any replications. Just by using information about my input model, I'm actually able to improve the estimate of the output. That's a control variant. Any questions about that? This is very closely related to those of you who go on to take a course that involves um, general linear, linear models. Um, you know, linear models, multivariate linear models, this is what they do behind the scenes. As you say, I've got a bunch of, I've got a factors I care about and factors that are just there, and but I know information about the factors that are there. So I'm going to use that information to reduce the variance in my estimate of the effect of the factors I care about. That's what's going on here. Okay, questions online. Okay. All right, so those are our first two that we cared about there, CRNs and CVs. So in today's lecture, I want to introduce AVs, and if we get so far, important sampling. Otherwise, um, I'll, we'll save important sampling for Tuesday. Um, so uh, antithetic variates, um, the, if we go back to thinking about CRNs, CRNs are only for relative performance of evaluation. I've got two models, X and Y. I want to see which one's better. And so I end up giving them both the same inputs, and then I look at their differences for every input. And so, and that's great, because by accounting for some variance in input, um, I can then remove some of that input, and um, each pair produces a difference that's independent from the other pairs. It all, it all works great. Can we come up with an analogous approach for estimating an absolute performance of a single model? So not comparing X to Y, but just making X better. And um, and so like control variance, that's sort of an example of that, where we um, we are not necessarily comparing X to Y, but we're just trying to make the variance or the, um, to make the estimate of Y better. So can I do something CRN-like to make another way to reduce the variance in an absolute performance measure. And if I think about it, if I'm estimating a single, just run a single model, not two models, just one model over and over and over again for 20 replications or 2000 replications or whatever, um, then, and if I look at my simulation output, um, sometimes I'll get high, like if this happens to be the mean that I would like to estimate, I don't know the mean ahead of time, it just happens to be the mean, um, if if I you know if, if if I'm just running this test and I happen to know that this is the mean, then the first couple of replications are above the mean. The next replication is below. The next couple are above. The next few are below. Um, there's no pattern. There, generally speaking, though, if I run a long enough number of replications, I will get replication. I will get outputs both above and below the mean, and it'll all wash out when I average them out. But by the law of large numbers, I have to run a lot of them 
for the washing out process to happen. If I only run three replications, then all of these are gonna be above the mean and, um, and it's gonna, I'll get an estimate that's way too high. Um, if I run four, it brings it down, but you know, five or six, it's still a little bit high. It's not until I run 20 or so, or even more, that I get a, a roughly equal number above the mean and below the mean that when I average them out, it all washes out. So is there a way for me to sort of engineer my random number to make it so that I don't need to count on the law of large numbers that for any small group, I will get likely um, the same number above the mean as below the mean. That's what I generate with the antithetic variance. So, um, so what I'd like to do is somehow make it so that if I run one replication that's above the mean, the next replication will be below. The next replication might be above the mean, but the next replication will be below. And so we get this kind of back and forth. And so it might be above, below, and then below, above. But the point is every pair will sort of straddle the mean, um, or there will be groups of pairs that straddle the mean. That's what I'd like to somehow create. And so can I do that somehow? Um, if I can, then, uh, then I have the ability to reduce the variance of my absolute estimator. So um, if I happen to be able to make it so that every replication, we'll call it A, uh, and the one that comes after it, B, if I group them together in a pair, and if I take the average of each one of those adjacent replications, that ends up becoming um, this estimator here, and it will be an unbiased estimator of the total thing. So it, it kind of makes sense that if I'm just taking two points and I take their average, their average should be an unbiased estimator um, of the thing that I'm actually trying to estimate. But the beauty of it is that if I take the variance of this little pairing here, of this arithmetic mean, then I do a little probability theory, and it's the variance of, um, of one sample plus the variance of another sample uh, plus the covariance between these samples and you know, scaled down by four. So the idea here is if I can manage to generate uh, an anti-correlation between every replication and the one after it. So if one if the one replication is high, the next one's low. If one replication is low, the next one's high. Then this here will end up being less than it would be if there's no correlation between the two. But I have to make sure that every time I run a replication, the next replication is kind of the opposite side of the mean as the previous replication. That's what I'd like to engineer. So can I generate negatively correlated pairs by playing with the random number streams? And of course, since I'm asking the question, it's apparently possible to do. So um, the idea here is I'm gonna take, um, I've got in this case, four replications. And um, if I think about what's going on inside a simulation model, it generates a random number seed, a new seed per replication. And it takes those random number seeds and with them, it generates uniformly distributed random numbers between zero and one. And so as I'm running down through a replication, um, let's say I need to draw an exponential random variable. Well, inside the machine, it's gonna convert a uniform random variable into an exponential using the inverse transform technique. So that's what I've got here. So you can think of that as the inverse transform of whatever distribution I want, let's say for my inter-arrival process. And it'll keep doing that for every customer or whatever. So there might be a thousand customers and it would do this for a thousand times and it'll go on over and over again. And then the next replication, it generates a new random number seed and that will generate a new uniformly distributed random number for each one of these positions. And it'll go and do that over and over again. So this is how a normal simulation runs. And so I can, mathematically view a simulation as a function h which itself takes as arguments these inverse transforms of these uniform uh, random numbers between zero and one so that's really you know if a simulation draws a thousand random numbers to generate a one output i can just view it as a function of a thousand numbers uniformly distributed between zero and one so that's how modeling a simulation so what I then can do is say, okay, I've run however many replications, say four replications this way. Um, what if for every one of those uniformly distributed random numbers, after I run, run one replication of it, I save those thousands of numbers for that replication and I just take one minus them. 
So if there were a thousand uniform distributed random numbers in replication one, I take their kind of complement, the one minus them. And then that means, and then I can plug them in to the same inverse functions here. And now I've got this new simulation replication. So replication one, I drew fresh numbers and ran them through inverse transforms. Replication two, I took all of my numbers that were fresh in replication one and did one minus them and ran them through the same inverse transforms. And then for replication three, I restart this whole process and get fresh numbers again. So every odd replication are fresh uniform numbers. Every even replication are one minus the ones that were drawn in the previous replication. And, um, and that will give me um, two numbers. So it'll give me an output for the, the, the normal and output for the complement for every kind of replication pair. So this is kind of a summary of that. Um, for every set of random numbers I generate, um, I'm also going to generate a complementary pair, and I'm going to generate effectively two replication outputs and then take their average. And that will truly be my replication output for this replication. So it's like every replication is doing double duty. You draw random numbers once, you complement them, rerun the simulation with a complicated version, take the average. And that is going to be the output for this replication. Then do it for another replication. Draw them, complement them, average. Draw them, complement them, average. Those are antithetic variants. So I take all those antithetic variants and, um, and then I just generate a confidence interval on them. I estimate the, uh, the performance of them. And, um, and so the example from the book that did this is, so this is without AVs turned on. Um, so these, yeah, this is the right. So these are without AVs turned on. Um, you've got the, Filled circles are the odd replications. The open circles are the even replications. And in this case, there's they're all independent. So it's sort of arbitrary which ones were paired together, but they just they took every odd replication and every even replication, they plotted them on top of each other. And then in the dark line, they plotted their average. And like you can see, the replications are all over the place. There's sort of a small smoothing effect from the averaging, but it's not much. Now, if I do the antithetic variance, then now I can see that in the pairs, um, I can almost guarantee, like here, um, I, the pairs don't always straddle the actual average. Here, most of the pairs straddle the actual average. So most of the time, if you generate something above the average, the next, the, the complementary version will generate something below the average and vice versa. And so now when I take the average, that bold average line is, uh, has far less variance than the version over here. So I've reduced the variance in that so that if I generate a confidence interval, it'll be tighter. So I get a higher powered estimate. So there are questions about that general idea before I show you a, a little MATLAB example similar to the previous one. Okay, so this is very similar to the previous one um, with my control variant, but now instead of using control variants, I'm using these antithetic variants to do a similar thing. So again, I've got an input, which is drawn from a uniform um, random number stream or uniform random numbers between zero and one. The output is just the exponential of that. So you can think of the output as kind of being a simulated version, but exp is your simulation. So again, I'm expecting this average to be 1.7183. We know that that's the true average. So I generate um, a thousand independent replications up here, and that'll generate a thousand Xs, run them through the exponential that generates a thousand Ys. And as we saw before, I end up getting, if I get to the mean and standard error of the mean, I get this thing here. So that's uh, the mean here, standard error of the mean. Um, it's pretty close, but um, maybe it could be closer. Now, instead, I could have used the same amount of effort, in fact, arguably less effort, to generate 500 random numbers. Because remember, random numbers are actually harder to generate than... Um, than these here, like just taking one minus that is a lot better than going through the whole um, uh, the um, the whole random number function that we've learned, you know, the LCGs. So rather than rerunning the CLCG over and over again, I only have to run it 500 times and then just do the complement to get the other half there. I run I get 500 of these exponentials, 
500 of those, which are the complementary part, take their average, and now I've got 500 numbers in Y. If I take its average in standard error, then I find that its average is far closer to the real average, and its standard error is an order of magnitude less. So with the same amount of simulation effort, in fact, arguably less than it, I get a much tighter estimation of the actual uh, performance. That's the antithetic variance. So any questions of that? Questions online? All right, so this is another one of those things, by the way, and I'll get to this, where it's not always going to work. Um, but uh, we're hoping that this little trick in your simulation model will generate these um, sort of, uh, th that generates these negative correlations. But it's not always going to work, and so you generally do have to run a pilot study. How do you generate these in ARENA? It's really similar to common random numbers. So you drag your seeds element in, just like before. You can click add to generate a new stream, or you can name it 10 if you want to be the normal stream. Um, you can leave seed value blank, or you can put something in there. It doesn't really matter, but just be consistent across models. Um, and then under initialize options, um, you, instead of selecting common or leaving it blank, you select antithetic. That's what it sort of says there on this projector. It's hard to read, um, but antithetic. And then that will automatically ensure this pattern. So what that will mean is that um, ARENA will generate fresh random draws every odd replication and every even replication behind the scenes before it does all of its inverse transforms. It will take the same numbers from the first replication, do one minus them, and then use those as the numbers to generate the outputs for the second replication. And, um, and then you'll get those outputs and then you can then average them um, as well. So it's not going to do the averaging for you, but it will guarantee that replication one and two are paired together, three and four are paired together, and so on. And that's just, again, rem reminding us how to specify streams. So then that's the output here. You'll get um, you know, two R replications. You can then pair them up together by taking these averages, and, um, and there you go. So any questions about antithetic variants, how they work? All right. Looks like we are going to get through important sampling then. OK, so then the last topic for this course to cover is important sampling. And so um, important sampling is, um, is an interesting idea where we're now we're actually going to introduce bias and then remove the bias, but through the process of introducing it, we'll actually be able to use less replications to estimate a rare event. So, um, so that like imagine this case, I have to, I've got a highly accurate model of a nuclear reactor. And so I know it's accurate in that it has all of the components the real nuclear reactor is. And I want to do a performance estimation of this highly accurate model of my nuclear reactor. And I want to basically say, how often in all of the runs of this nuclear reactor am I going to get a meltdown situation where the reactor temperature is greater than some threshold? Now, if this reactor has been well designed, this probability should be really, really low. This should be a rare event. But still, as an engineer, it's good for me to know how rare it is. Is this like, you know, 1% of the time, half a percent of the time, a thousandth of a percent of the time? Because, you know, you're going to build this thing once and, you know, it might be 100 years before one of these catastrophic events happens. Um, but and, and you have to sort of know, like, how often are these catastrophic events going to occur? Because it'll probably be outside of the normal window that um, that you're, you're thinking about. So I would like to estimate this, but I really need this to be an accurate estimation, estimation of this rare event. Now, the problem is rare events are rare. And so if you run 500 simulations, 500 replications on the computer, you're probably not going to see one of those rare events. So, um, so we, we need a way to sort of generate more rare events in our simulation budget, and yet still be able to accurately predict how rare they are um, in reality. So that's what we're going to get to here. 
So assume that our reactor simulation um, takes as an input variable X. Uh, so this might be the temperature of the day. Um, this might be um, you know, some, some physical variable that affects the operation of the reactor. So again, I think daytime temperature, maybe that's, that's fine. Um, and it has some probability density function. Let sim, that's just our generic um, function, which represents the simulation. So all of the simulation bundled up into a function I'm calling sim. So let sim x denote the output uh, temperature when the input, let's say the external temperature is x. So I would like to use our simulation replications to estimate the probability that my output uh, for whatever the input is, is greater than the temperature, which um, is equal to uh, the expected value of this thing. This is called the Iverson bracket. Basically, these brackets mean that whenever this condition is true, it returns a one. Whenever this tradition is false, it returns a zero. So it says down here. So if you basically keep track of, okay, I ran a replication and temperature was too hot one random location it was fine zero and you do that you get a, a string of zeros and ones and if i take the expected value of that or the mean of that so if i estimate it by that then that should be um uh, approximately equal to the probability of this rare event well that sounds fine um but the problem is going to be that if this rare event doesn't happen in the 100 replications i chose to run then i am going to underestimate the rare event to never happen the reality was just so rare that I didn't see it in 100 replications. Like if you're flipping a coin that only comes up heads one out of every, you know, with a probability of one out of a thousand, if you flip those coins 100 times, it's going to go up tails 100 times most of the time. So it's going to be very rare to catch that. So, you know, you're not going to know whether the probability of it coming up heads is one out of a thousand or one out of 10,000. Because for both of those, if you only run 100, you're not going to notice a difference. And so that's kind of what we're trying to deal with here. So how do we deal with that mathematically? Well, the expected value of any function of a random variable can be written like this thing here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what if I can generate, imagine I'm in a bizarro universe where temperatures are super, super hot. And I know how the temperatures of the day in that bizarro universe compare the temperatures of the day say in my universe. So if my universe's temperatures look like a bell curve centered around, I don't know, 80 degrees or something like that, then that universe's temperatures are a bell curve centered around 420 degrees or something. It's like super, super hot there. But I know their distribution and I know my distribution. Um, and so I would like to take my reactor out I want to stress test basically my reactor. I'm going to move my nuclear reactor into this universe where um, things are super hot. Like right now, Artemis One just got launched. You know, it's heading to the moon. Um, it's unmanned, and uh, uh, and they said that they're going to have that uh, have Artemis One go through maneuvers that they do not plan to ever go through when there's a human on board because they want to stress test it, and uh, and so they want to push it outside of its bounds. And that way, if they know if they if they know what the normal uh, behaviors are, and they know what the bizarro behaviors are, then they can actually translate how often events happen in bizarro world into how often things would happen under normal situations. That's important sampling. That's what we're doing right here. So we we this y is temperature in bizarro world, maneuvers in bizarro world, the things you would never do under normal kin situations. And it's got its own distribution. This is like the temperature distribution in our bizarro universe. All that we require is the range of the two random variables are the same. Uh, but, um, but this random variable is going to overexpress um, inputs that are likely to generate uh, flaws, errors, problems. So then I can take this expected value and I can write this equivalent thing here. Basically, I'm taking you know, this probability density function is still there, but I'm going to multiply it by unity here. The probability density of Y divided by the probability density of Y. I didn't change anything. I just introduced this new probability density here. And this ratio here that's in between, um, I'm going to call it W, and I'm referring to it as the likelihood ratio of X and Y, of F of X and F of Y, of the distribution in reality to bizarro distribution. And then, so this expression that I've just written here 
is equivalent to the expected value of the simulation taking y as an input times the likelihood ratio over the distribution of y. So it's like I can say, well, I can either simulate um, in the real world with real temperatures, or I can simulate in the fake world with crazy temperatures, just so long as the performance variable that comes out of my sim, after it comes out of my sim, it gets multiplied by this likelihood ratio. And after that, then the expected value in the bizarro world after scaling will actually equal the expected value in the real world if I hadn't biased my inputs. That's important sampling. So I estimate um, my, uh, my expected value in the real world using the temperatures from the bizarro world um, and you end up getting this again. So it's, I run R replications of my sim. I scale it by the likelihood ratio, divide by R to get my arithmetic mean. And that's how I end up uh, estimating it. So that's how important sampling works. Um, and I wanna do an example um, kind of, again, in a sort of a MATLAB example here. But before I do that example, are there general questions about this idea? About choosing input models that are purposely bad. So long as you know how to compare the bad input models to the real input models. And that allows you to generate, take results in the bad world and convert them into the results that you would have gotten in your world. So we had... a you know, in X, the rare event never happens. In Y, the rare event happens all the time. So by scaling by the likelihood ratio, we turn the all the time uh, proportion back into the rare proportion, but we only have to run a couple of replications in Y universe, whereas we might have to run millions of replications in the X universe to get the same thing. That's important sampling. Any questions online? Okay, so let's do it a little numerical example of this. Um, I've got a simple simulation which just passes the input to the output. So I'm just saying this is the dumbest simulation ever where um, the output performance variable is just exactly the input. Um, so it's like, um, you know, it doesn't run, it runs for one customer and that one customer's age is the performance or something like that. Um, and so, I want to estimate what's the probability that my simulation is greater than five. So five is my critical threshold. And my input values, my input model here, the correct input model, is the standard normal. So um, the standard normal, as I think, you know, those of you are, you know, as you're, you're thinking about lean, six sigma, and all of that, then, you know, we know that five, and effectively I'm saying, what's the probability that I'll be five standard deviations away um, from the mean of a, of a normal. Well, that's really low probability, right? So um, the probability that the expected probability here is this number. It's a really small number. You know, the, the integral under the curve, under that, that tail of the curve is, is pretty small. So, um, so I would like to, but let's say I didn't know that I could solve for this mathematically. And so I want to estimate it with my sim. So I run um, 10 million replications. So I draw 10 million standard normal variables, variates. And basically, and that's what I'm doing here, 10 million standard normal variables. And I ask how many of them are greater than five. And I run this into MATLAB and it doesn't give me zero point anything. It just gives me zero. Why did MATLAB give me exactly zero? Anybody have a guess? I ran 10 million replications. And MATLAB doesn't give me a decimal point at all when I run that mean. Any thoughts? Why would it be exactly zero? This is not the important sampling. This is what we do before the important sampling. We do the important sampling to solve this. If you take an arithmetic mean and it's uh, of a 10 million numbers and it ends up being zero, what does that tell you about the 10 million numbers? Just think about it algebraically. Any thoughts? Just your intuition. So you take, this is not stats or anything. It's just, it's just if I'm taking average of 10 million numbers, that's what this. So 
the, the thing inside the mean are numbers that are the zero or one. It's basically how often is this, these 10 million numbers greater than five. And so if the random variable is less than five, this will be a zero. If it's greater than or equal to five, it'll be a one. So I'm taking a mean of a bunch of numbers, either zero or one, and I have 10 million of these zeros or ones, and taking them average of these 10 million zeros or ones gives me exactly zero. So any thoughts on line two of why this would happen? It's not 0 0.0004, it's not 0 0.003, no guesses. We got plenty of time. I can stay in here for 15 minutes. It's a guess, exactly zero. Why would I get exactly zero when I've got 10 million numbers I'm averaging together? I get exactly zero. And they're all positive, these numbers. Nova. Yeah. That, that, that is ultimately that's the right answer that that the probability of this event that the probability for a standard normal to be greater than five is really, really, really small. And so that's ultimately what's causing this. So approximately, you know, closer to what's going on here. So what does that mean about this vector? This is a 10 million long vector. And if I take its arithmetic mean, it gives me exactly zero, not 0 0.0000002, it gives me exactly zero. So what does that mean about the 10 million long vector? And it's related to that fact that was just pointed out, that this probability is really small. And remember, the elements of the vector can either be zero or one. And so I'm taking the average of 10 million things that are either zero or one, and I'm getting exactly zero. And this isn't a floating point error or anything like that. It's, it is, it's true that the, the average of these 10 million numbers is exactly zero, no decimal. It's, it's a really simple answer. It has nothing to do with stats or anything else. Just a high school level sort of algebra type answer. But it relates to simulation. Any other guesses? That is the right answer ultimately, but I'm looking for more approximately, you know, what does it say about this vector? How many ones are in this vector? Remember this vector can either be one if these numbers are greater than five uh, or zero if these numbers are less than five. How many ones are in this list of 10 million out outputs? If I average these zero and ones, and it comes out to exactly zero. Zero, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm trying to say here, that, that I ran 10 million stochastic simulations and all, all of the 10 million stochastic simulations, all of them, were less than five, all random draws from this normal, uh, from this standard normal, all of them were less than or equal to, or less than five. So this is such a rare event, like 10 million replications. I've never asked you to generate 10 million replications of any simulation in this course. That's a lot of replications of a sim. And you would think after 10 million replications, if there was a rare event, Certainly it would pop up at least once, and it didn't. So this motivates why we need important sampling. In order for us to estimate numbers that are frequencies that are this small, we can't just run the simulation normally. We have to shake it up in some way that's novel. We have to stress test it. So what we're going to do to stress test it is we're not going to take the input to be the standard normal we're going to shift it a little bit and say, what if our input is actually shifted up um, so that it's uh, uh, still a normal with a, a, a variance of one, 
but its mean is five. So now normally, so to speak, we would take inputs that are centered around zero. This is just like my example, like the nuclear reactor normally has outside temperatures that are centered around 80 degrees. But um, we, um, we, we transport it to a bizarro universe in SIM where the outside temperatures are 400 degrees. So it's kind of what we're doing here. We're forcing our SIM to operate on weird inputs that are way different from our real inputs just to try to exorcise, exercise um, these, um, these rare events. And so, um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to run that through and we have to generate for every value that's generated um, here, um, we need to calculate a likelihood ratio. So for every value that we're going to draw from the standard normal, we're going to take that value, plug it into the density function for our normal input model. So that's f of x. And then we're going to divide it by the density function for our bizarro input model, f of y. And so that ends up just being the PDF of a standard normal uh, with y, and then a PDF of standard normal minus y. So that's how it happens to be just for the standard normal. But that's what we do generally here. And we end up getting some expression that we can evaluate for every value we draw out of this distribution. We can also then scale the whole simulation by this likelihood ratio, this expression here. So now we're going to draw some sim, some inputs from this model here, this input model. So not 10 million. We'll be able to draw a lot less than that. Run each one of those through our simulation, which our simulation is just the identity function. So we're just going to take exactly those as the output. Um, and then take that output and scale it by this likelihood ratio and then take the average of that scaled version. So what does that look like? So I'm only drawing a thousand data points, but I'm now drawing them from the normal centered at five. So this is a standard normal shifted up to five. And so I'm now going to generate what I'm calling H prime here, which is going to be um, how many outputs from the SIM are greater than five. And then I'm going to take each one of those. So each one of these is either going to be a zero or a one. And I'm multiplied by our likelihood function. This is our f of x divided by f of y. And, um, and that's going to give me some new vector h prime. If I take the mean of that h prime, it's a really small number. I can then generate the standard error. And there it is there. And then I can actually then go and generate the half width. So now I can look at the 95% confidence interval, which is this, and compare it to the true estimate, which is here. And this confidence interval is pretty tiny, and it is exactly the right order of magnitude is what I needed there. So in the normal world, where I generated X from the input model that I fit from data, in that world, I ran 10 million replications of my simulation, and the rare event happened never. So then I just chose an input model that is that I... I felt like probably would be really difficult on my system. Like it's a really hard set of customers. And, in, and I only ran a thousand replications on my SIM with that really difficult input model. And then I scaled the outputs of my model by this likelihood ratio thing, which is just the distribution of my real input model divided by the distribution of my bizarro input model and took the average of the result. And that gave me this confidence interval down here which captures, I mean, there's still, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, if I generated more replications, that confidence interval will get tighter. But now I actually can estimate that, um, that you know, the, the real rate here is probably is gonna be less than this number or greater than this number with 95% confidence. So in the first experiment, I come back to my boss and say, hey boss, the nuclear reactor will never melt down. That's great. Uh, but in reality, that was just an artifact of the rare event and the fact that I had not enough samples. Now, in this one, with very few samples, I can come back to my boss and say, actually, we know that um, it will um, melt down with this probability. Um, so this is the proportion of, um, of runs or days or whatever uh, we're, we're simulating it on. Um, so every day, this will be the probability that we'll get a meltdown. And it's a small number, but we've been able to estimate it with a very number, very small number of replications. All right, so any questions about that? The general idea of important sampling. This is a, uh, 
a very general framework. Um, I had a paper that I had to review for a robotics conference that was doing this in a robotics application, the, trying to, um, so, as, so as an example there, um, you know, you've got all these autonomous vehicles driving around on the, on the, the roads. There will be rare events. Those vehicles will collide um, into things periodically, but they happen very rarely. So what do people do? They have generate simulations, high, high fidelity simulations of the autonomous vehicles out there, the Waymo vehicles, et cetera, um, in a wide variety of uh, cases that we think are like what goes on in real life. And what they find is when they're very, very similar to real life, then you don't get that many of these catastrophic events. And so you don't actually know how often these catastrophic events occur, but you can go into simulation and you can then start like, you know, turning it from, um, from kind of ASU campus in summer to ASU campus in the first couple of weeks of fall with people this cross in the streets randomly and everything. And of course, you get a bunch of those um, those events, uh, those catastrophic events increase in simulation, and then you can translate them into, all right, well, so maybe that level of pedestrian traffic was far too high for reality, but we know the normal pedestrian traffic. So rather than rerunning our sim with the real pedestrian traffic, we can take our bizarro pedestrian traffic and get the real probability of crash events um, with very few replications. That's the idea here. That's important sampling. Okay. The questions on that. Questions online. Okay. So um so I'll give you the attendance question here. Um, that pretty much is it for all the new content to the course. I'm gonna do sort of, like I say, course overview. Uh, we'll rerun through um, the VRTs um, in a slightly different format. I'll actually have a PowerPoint presentation on Tuesday instead of these LaTeX slides. Um, but, um, but like I said, Tuesday is not a critical lecture. If you wanna use one of your drops, you know, it's, you know, it'll be recorded as well because uh, you know, next week is the holiday. That's totally fine, but um, but keep working on your final projects. You've all got that feedback back from your input modeling reports. Um, and then you'll come back after Thanksgiving and uh, it's the last week of classes. And so Tuesday, we'll have the final exam review lecture. Wednesday, all your final project subs due. Thursday, stage one final exam. Saturday, your peer reviews will be due. Stage two will be during finals week. So that's the pattern going forward. So any questions before we close out today? And I will double check um, and fix these slides about those um, sheets, the crib sheets. But follow the syllabus. It'll be whatever the syllabus says. All right, so in that case, um, let me put the uh, URL in the chat. I can get the mouse back. All right, so Zoom is doing that thing online where I can't uh, shift to the chat. Let me try um, quitting out a skin here. See if Zoom will. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'll put the. I'm trying to put the URL for the attendance question in the chat. I don't know why this new version of Zoom is so sluggish, but okay, the URL's in the chat. I'll try to type the question to the chat as well. So the question here I have is, um, of the four CRT or VRTs, the variance reduction techniques that we have discussed, um, which one of them um, uses complementary values of random numbers to improve absolute performance estimation? So it's the one where you, you run all the odd numbers, all the odd replications get fresh random numbers, all the even replications get complementary versions, 
of the odd ones. So which of the four um, works that way? So which of the four VRTs uses complementary random numbers to improve absolute performance estimation? And that's all I've got for you today. So uh, we'll see you on Tuesday, unless we don't. And I hope you have a good weekend. And for those of you who may not show up on Tuesday, I hope you have a nice holiday. Any other questions online? If not, then I will go ahead and close the room. All right, have a good weekend.